party, man. Yeah, I can dig it. Stop. Right on. Hey, man, what's your name? Good morning and welcome. To the Earl Ingram Show. As always, you can join us at 844-967-2789, 844-967-2789. Text us at that same number. Good morning, Chief Calvin. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Earl. How are you? Fine. Now, yesterday was 49 degrees in Milwaukee, man. Tied a record. Yesterday was. Yes. Yeah, this morning it was snowing on my way out yeah. here a little bit. <laughs> well... Sand, well, by now, you know who that voice is. That's Sandy Williams, my co-host. Good morning to you, Sandy. How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I watched the I watched the uh, weather person this morning say that winter is officially two-thirds done with. Well, today, you know what today is? What? Groundhog Day. Uh, is today? it Today? Punxsutawney, Punxsutawney comes out, looks for his shadow or her. I don't know whether I don't know whether this groundhog was gender neutral or what. Uh, yeah, today's the day. And saw the shadow. I had, I haven't heard. Yeah, I haven't heard. I, I heard him say he saw the shadow, which means you know it's going to be a, qu- uh, a a quicker or an earlier summer, earlier spring, 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 yeah. spring. Well, um, Sandy, next week three. 50s on the docket. 50 degree days? Yes. Yeah, well, I'm glad I didn't uh, lay, <laughs> lay down that ice rink, I'll tell you. <laughs> 350 degree days. We're going to be 45 and above. Welcome to, all the way through welcome next to week. Charlotte. Well, but you know, you know, uh, Sandy, it's not just Wisconsin, it's all over the nation, the warm temperatures. Yeah. It's just not like it used to be. No, it, it may never ever be like that again, right? Well, like I, you know, that's that's the same. That's true about everything, right? Nostalgia. You can't. You can. You can look back and think warmly about it, but you can't recreate it. You can't do it over. Well, Sandy, I you know uh, know about you, but I'm not upset about it not being forty below for with the wind chill. Yeah, I think that's proof of manhood. You know. <laughs> Get out there in that raw, cold weather and prove what you got, you hey, know? Hey, Calvin, uh, did you hear Sandy? I heard him, and I guess I'll I'll pass on the manhood. <laughs> well, in fact, manhood's a, that's a, that's, that's thin ice to even use, use that term, uh, uh, but uh, it's definitely a test. It's a test of character, let's put it that way. You know, you know Sandy, I remember... Here we go, people. Here they go again. I remember. Well, you know, Sandy, New Year's, when I was a young person going out on New Year's, it was always well below zero. It was cold. Yeah. You know, and um, and so you got in and you knew it was going to be cold. January's always like the coldest month of the year. We only had one bad week in January, right? The others were... 30 and above. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've had, we had about four, three and a half weeks of real winter so far. The rest of it's all been something much more like Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. And it looks like we're returning to the same, the same thing. So, yeah, our, our, our climate is definitely changing. And, and uh, we're, you know, without arguing about cause, simply saying, yeah, the climate is definitely changing. You, you, you know, Sandy, it's... Uh... It, it, it is something that I'll tell you, I'm not crying crocodile tears. We, we're just about where we should be with the snow. You know, last year we, we, we kind of had a drought, right? I mean, during the spring and during the summer, we, we had drought yeah, and, yeah. but we've kind of caught up. Well, we should, you know, you know, I wonder if you do weather on the radio whether you, whether you have to be quite as uh, dynamic a person, you know, when you talk here, we're talking weather and it's, we're sort of moving along slowly. Yeah, sl- <laughs> slogging is, we're slogging through the yeah. weather here, Earl. I think I'm done with the weather. <laughs> right, man. Well, I'm not done with it. Ah. And not until three days of 50 next week. Okay. Uh, anyway, Sandy, um, we got a lot to talk about. I want to go here, man. You know, I'm, I'm a guy who goes to some brewer games, right? Yeah. 
I've gone to Brewer games in the past, uh, and every time I go to the Brewer game and Burns is on the mound, you can rest assured the Brewers have a better than 50-50 chance that they're going to win the game because he's going to hold the other team to one or two runs, three at the most. Yeah, I think his, his, I noticed his, his uh, ERA was 3.23, which is, okay. which is low in today's world. And he's got, you know, he was an all-star, I think, last year. He's been a multiple-year all-star. I remember when they brought Corbin Burns. Well, we're not sports broadcasters. Can we talk about sports? We can. And okay. <laughs> however, I will tell you, baseball, I gave up on baseball when the Braves went to Atlanta, pretty much. Although I have to say that I did go to a, a couple of World Series games back in the 80s when they were, you know, so I'm a fair weather. I'm a fair uh, weather baseball fan. But you know who Corbin Burns is. I do know who Corbin Burns Corbin is. Corbin Burns is one of the best pitchers in baseball. Yeah. I noticed they, and they trade him and they get a prospect and a 24th round draft choice. I, I couldn't figure this well, out. Well, Sandy, they, they were concerned about how much money they would have to pay him. Yeah, they didn't ask me before the trade. I know, I know that. <laughs> so my point to you, Sandy, is... They just got a half a billion dollars from from the state, right? Well, that that all goes into the stadium. Yeah, but but it means that they're not going to have to put as much there. They gives them some added capital that they really could have paid. Well, yeah, Burns. yeah. Presumably, the the improved stadium increases their their revenue stream. And I don't know. I, I suspect the Brewers have all, have lately been a low payroll team. I, I don't think they they lose money year to year. No, I'm, I'm not sure. And 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 the the article I read after reading this confounding news about getting a prospect and a 24th round draft choice was that the general manager of the Brewers is all about winning a championship this year. Oh so come on! Somehow <laughs> somehow this deal was supposed to smack of aggressive general managing so that they're going to really be improving the team. I didn't get it. Not by getting rid of Corbin Burns. Okay. You don't improve your team. And I, I can tell you, I'm a guy I probably go to 10 Brewer games a year. Uh, so, you know. Is that I, so you don't, is that to like get over insomnia? <laughs> hey, so when guy, friends are asking, hero, can you, and, and, and we, the radio station has brewer, uh, brewers on yeah. in our lineup. And so, you know, we go, we go to the game from time to time. And, and so Sandy, what it, what it amounts to is, Every time I go to a game, it's one to nothing. Yeah, that's what I'm two, saying. Two to one. The insomnia thing. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you, can, you can get over it there. And you know, a, Go ahead. Well, baseball, you know, is an odd sport because it's all about athleticism and it's not so much about hustle or conditioning, although it's become more of that. But I always felt like, like baseball on the playground was just a, an opportunity for embarrassment, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, so... So they would always say, oh, what a great game. One to nothing. It was a great game. And I walk out. I want 14 to 12. To me, that's a great game. I, Offense. I, I went to my most memorable game was going to see Earl Wilson pitch a no hitter for the Braves. And I, I sat right behind the catcher. I had some friend who had these great seats. So I watched a no hitter, which is like, that's no runs, okay? That was like the, the game was one to nothing, but it was an exciting game. So Sandy, no hitters are exciting. I, I remember the Warren Spahn, Luber Debt, Hank Aaron, Rico Cardi. But you don't remember Earl Wilson? Never. He was he he couldn't have been around during their time. Yeah, he was. He pitched. Uh, he he was on the pitching staff uh, the with same, Warren Spahn and Luber Debt and those Burdett, guys. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. I'll he look him up been, just to make sure yeah, my memory must, isn't yeah, faulty. He must, he must have been a fringe guy. Uh, let's go to Stephen from Green Bay. I don't know what Steve. Oh, well, Stephen is young enough to know about the Brewers. Hey, good morning to you, Stephen. How you doing, man? Good can, morning. Can, can um, you believe I, we're talking baseball, I, man? Go ahead. No, I, I can't, but it's refreshing. You know, sometimes it's, it's okay to talk about something that's not so, you know, negative. Um, with that being said... Um, when I saw the trade come across my phone last night, you know that, that scene from the mask where, you know, his jaw drops to the yeah. floor and his tongue <laughs> yeah. comes out of his mouth? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was kind of me when I saw that they traded Corbin Burns. Um, and then I saw what they got back for him, and I, and I guess I just don't understand it. 
Um, you know, Corbin Burns isn't the first high you know, high-profile pitcher we let go this year. We let go of Woody as well. Now, under, I understand oh, that yeah, Woody right. wouldn't have been able to play this year anyways. Um, but, yeah, I just don't understand how they think they're making our team better with getting rid of 50% of our pitching staff and two studs on the team. I, I don't I, – I, right now, and this is just my prediction, um, I don't think the Brewers are making it – anywhere this year, to be honest with you, and it hurts me to say that. Well, 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 there are two things. Um, number one, they're not making the team better. They're making it cheaper. And and then at the same time, they've gotten – they don't have – who was the coach they had all those years? Man, how can I forget the coach's name? Let me just intersect. I've done my research now. Okay, go ahead. This no-hitter pitcher was Jim Wilson. Jim Wilson. Okay. 1954. Well, 1954. I was sitting in, in the, yeah, I was a 10 year old kid sitting there in the, behind the catcher thinking it was great. Sandy, 1954 was the date of my birth. I mean, the year of my birth. I know. Let's so, uh, I, I just, <laughs> we both just revealed. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, why am I forgetting the Brewers um, coach for all those years? He's no longer there. Back Craig Council. Craig Council. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Stephen, you know it's going to be different because Craig Council uh, is not going to be there. You know who is the, you know, the the manager now though is the guy who managed Craig Council at Notre Dame University. Really? Yeah. The guy that they hired was yeah, hired he, he, by Council because Council knew and liked him because he was Council's manager, coach uh, at Notre Dame. So, Sandy, I, I think it's safe to say that guy won't make as much money as Council was making. No, I think, that's, <laughs> I think that's right. So so they're cutting payroll. Here's, here's a fact to it. I grew up in a house in Whitefish Bay that Craig Council lives in right now. So I, I am connected to baseball in that particular manner. And he'll probably stay there because he's in Chicago. Yeah, I think he probably will. Yeah. All right. Um, 844-967-2789. Sandy, what are we going to be doing? Well, I think, you know, when we come back, uh, I think we should, uh, we'll, shake, we'll, sh- we'll shake things up a little bit. That's what we'll be doing. All right. 844-967-2789. We'll be right back. Show as always, you can join us at 844 967 2789. Text us that same number. It's Friday, that means Fridays with my co host Sandy Williams. You know, Sandy, before we get into some other things, you and I and our radio station is going to be engaged in the Republican uh, convention in Milwaukee as well as we'll be doing some live stuff from the Democratic convention in Chicago. Um, Really kind of excited about being around all that action. It's an exciting thing. I, you know, I've been to one. I, I went. I was in a, a at a Democratic convention when I worked for Pat Lucy, and he was trying to be vice president of the United States. And and uh, the guy got pretty involved in the processes on the floor, et cetera. It's uh, it's different. It's a it's, lot of action. Huh? Yeah, a lot of action. It's something like. Uh, the commodity exchange, you know. <laughs> well, but you got to figure that was back then, and the this massiveness of it today 
probably is just... Yeah, you know, the, the, the conventions back then, there was far less that it was totally resolved at the time. And so, yeah, the candidate was pretty well uh, pegged, but there was still a lot of business to be done at the convention. These conventions these days are, are pretty much eyewash. They're, they're staged to try and create uh, a political impression. Sandy, I want to... We've talked about it. We're going to continue to talk about it because it continues to be an issue. And that's the border. And, and so Republicans are going to have to send it caught between a rock and a hard place. Well, you know, they're at the leadership of the Republican Party appears to be trying to do the right thing, particularly at the Senate level. And they've they've apparently reached a negotiation. Schumer uh, indicated that they had resolved uh, the major issues. The negotiators on the Republican side and and uh, the independent who was negotiating um, have all indicated, yeah, we got an agreement. Uh, and it looks to me like it accomplishes almost everything that that the uh, conservatives have wanted to have accomplished at the border. They've uh, they're going to stop this program of what's called catch and release, which basically means a parole without supervision and surveillance. The the new bill would require that anyone who comes across the border and is awaiting their hearing will be under constant surveillance uh, by the government. Now, uh, and and some of the and then uh, establishing a break point, more than five thousand encounters in a day, and the and the president can shut down the border till they can catch up. Uh, and and a couple of other things. You know, the sticking points appear to be twofold. One, Donald Trump and the and this and the hard right and the Republicans, particularly in the House, are saying we don't want to pass anything during Biden because it'll it'll neutralize this issue. We'd rather have this issue to run against Biden than we would have the issue resolved for the American people. That's number one. Number two, there are some Republicans who appear to be reluctant to fund it, okay? And House, every, House Republicans. House Republicans. And and the fact is that everyone has known that one of the reasons we have the problem is the is the agency responsible for handling all of this stuff is underfunded and understaffed. And so in order to catch up to the problem, it's going to require material funding and as well to, for instance, put a million people under surveillance or whatever the number is of these people awaiting uh, their hearings is a very expensive process. I, I was listening the other day and I forgot where it was. And there was, um, some Republicans who were saying people will be complaining if we, there's X amount of dollars available, we'd have to take that money from somewhere else to fund it. How would people like it if that money came out of social security or Medicare to fund the border. And I'm like, really? Well, those, maybe, are, those are the places. Well, interestingly, maybe what it could come out of <laughs> is not giving the tax break that's being, uh, that's part of this new child, uh, child da- tax, credit. Uh, tax credit that involves additional uh, tax reduction rights for corporations. I mean, people who talk about not having enough money need to be worried about pursuing further revenue cuts because of course that means we have less money and, and furthermore, you know, uh, talking about taking it out of social security is sort of the same thing as when we have a government shutdown. And the first thing we shut down is every park that people like going to, or, you know, so you, so you try to create political pressure by picking and choosing the things you, you take money out of to be the things that are particularly popular. You you know, Sandy, I don't, I don't know if it's just that you and I focus on on things that that to me make sense. To me, when you hear somebody say we 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 can't afford to do that, at the same time they're asking for increases in that military budget. Sandy, imagine the amount of money they're going to be pushing to the military because of, of, of what's happening in Israel, what's still happening in Ukraine, what's happening now, you know, with well, in our Syri- skirmish in the Middle East. Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. and Syria. Yeah, I mean. People don't know what's coming. 
Well, I mean, that's the problem is that, is that, uh, we don't tend, we don't tend to look at our whole budget like a family and say, okay, we're spending a lot of money here. Can we cut it? Can we cut money here so we can spend it over here where we really need to? And we just talk about things singularly. And so, you know, we've got Lindsey Graham jumping up and down saying we ought to, we ought to retaliate directly against Iran. That would be an enormously, potentially enormously expensive venture, number one. And number two, I'm not sure it's at all proportionate to the situation. Like I talked about on Tuesday, we're a massive arms seller, uh, and so is Iran. And if, if we decide we're going to attack Iran every time some munitions that they sell get deployed in a manner that we don't like, uh, that's going to be a serious problem. All right. Uh, hang in there. We're going to talk about uh, many things on uh, our return uh, we're going to continue to talk about the border bill, child tax credit, the, the skirmish that continues in the Middle East, and we're going to continue to do that with Sandy Williams. the Earl Ingram Show. As always, you can join us at 844-967-2789. Text us at that same number. It's uh, Friday. That means Friday's with my co-host, Sandy. So, Sandy, uh, it's Black History Month, and so we're going to be doing a lot of things on the show uh, this month, having a lot of professors and grills and other people who will be able to tell some some stories about uh uh, black history in the state of Wisconsin. And so there are many people who don't understand in many rural areas that they were uh, refuges uh, for slaves yeah, who I mean, came yeah. through the Underground Railroad. Wisconsin was one of the main states that provided refuge for runaway slaves. Yeah, Wisconsin was uh, had an active Underground Railroad, and what's interesting is the Underground Railroad in Wisconsin was primarily rural communities. Wisconsin was primarily rural. I mean, a, right. a Milwaukee and was probably the only urban center at the time. Uh, and you know, in fact, I remember my I had a son who worked in a restaurant in Middleton, Wisconsin, and was sitting there eating in the basement there, and there was a placard describing how it was a, the site of an underground railroad safe house. Uh, and these, these exist all around Wisconsin. Uh, and you know, the Wisconsin's had a very progressive, it's rural community was, was, uh, very progressive at the time and, and had a, had an activist, uh, sense about itself because, you know, these slaves were all subject to being taken by bounty hunters and uh, and they were at risk to be uh, seized and taken back, and the people who were harboring them were at risk as well. And so, you know, it was a time of, of great uh, both heroism and danger. It was a little bit like uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, Jews uh, of Germany and people being t- uh, saved and, and at that point. 
the, the people who supported the slaves were taking the same kind of risk. You know, on, uh, on this Monday the 5th, I'm going to have the curator and owner of the Wisconsin's Black Historical Society and Museum, Claiborne Benson, who's going to be with us. He knows that history. He knows the towns. He knows where it transpired. The people who he studied all of those things. And there's some parts of the state of Wisconsin that I'm sure people live in today, rural Wisconsin, who don't even know these things took place. Uh, the fact that that in their towns, those people took the risk and major risk at the time. You talked about bounty hunters. Yeah, yeah. These were these people were property of someone. Excuse me, and who got away, and so they they hunted their property. They wanted to make sure they got their property back. And anybody who was harboring fugitives, you know, back then it kind of wasn't. You know, you call the police. It's kind of you took care of this thing yourself, right? Right. So I mean, there, there was a great deal of risk associated with participating in the Underground Railroad, and there was a great deal of participation in it in Wisconsin. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to be talking about those things uh, in the coming weeks and uh, uh, on the show. Sandy, I want to I want to um, get to we, 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 we just I was looking at this thing with Ukraine. Last month, Russia lost more weaponry and soldiers than they did at any other time. During the war, Sandy, I was, I was kind of amazed. Well, the Russians have adopted a strategy, at least as reported. And like I've said, you know, it's very hard to get truth and facts out of this whole Ukrainian conflict because both sides are providing inf- information that is uh, very propaganda driven. And I'm not sure how many, how much uh, th- uh, third party uh, unbiased observation is ongoing, but the, the Russians have adopted a strategy that's much more uh, sort of uh, waves of uh, it's it's warfare of uh, that, that, it, that spend lives a, a great deal. And the, and the Russians have always been known for that kind of warfare. That's one of the reasons they lost a, a, upwards of uh, 25 million people during World War II, uh, half of those being military because of the, their style, which was essentially uh, sending waves of, of men into uh, gunfire to overwhelm the opponent. And, you know, they've, they've uh, conscripted lots of, of convicts in Russia, and this is no one. And these convicts are spent in a manner that's probably different than they would normally be spending their military in terms of how they use them in warfare. So, yeah, there have been lots of casualties, but there's currently a, an assessment that the, the Russians have more capacity right now to fight than the Ukrainians based on the level of munitions and the level of manpower available. So, you know, that, you know, my hope had been that, that, uh, there was enough, enough losses being experienced on both sides that they would decide that it was time for a ceasefire. Let, let me ask you, Sandy, it's been two years. You, I remember the first conversation you and I had about the invasion and I don't think you even thought it would still be going at this point. Well, I think the general assessment at the time was, first of all, in the first day or two, the assessment was that Russia would just overwhelm Ukraine, and that didn't happen. And when the war was in its third week, everyone said, holy cow, this thing's ongoing, and it looks like it's actually going to be more than just a a short skirmish and a surrender. Uh, And now it's two years, and and we're at a a situation of great stalemate. The EU has just promised... Uh, 54 billion dollars to Ukraine, uh, and so and, and the United States. If we can ever uh, get this straightened out in the Senate, uh, Biden is talking about uh, uh, 60. A, a long-term 60 billion. So you've got there about 114 billion dollars of uh, money that's being promised to Ukraine, which ought to give Russia pause because the 114 billion should give Ukraine the capacity to mount. Uh, both a strong defense of itself and maybe in some offensive uh, activity. Ukraine has currently been using its offensive weaponry in a way that reaches all the way up to St. Petersburg. They had drones that, that blew up uh, uh, some oil facilities in St. Petersburg, which is 
a long ways away from Ukraine, about 750 miles north. Let me ask you, Sandy, because I remember you also saying, I can say years ago now, that this would be a point in time, um, you know, where where this could slog on and on and on. We're, we're kind of at a point where it's slogging on and on and on. Let me ask you, why hasn't there been diplomacy? Why, why can't we, wh- who's going to create the environment for diplomacy? Clearly, the two of them together, somebody has, and I thought China was the one who was going to be, it, we knew it wasn't going to be America, but I thought China would be the one that would, would have stepped in and tried to create the dialogue at least. Well, I think if China maintained independence from Russia in that process, they would have a shot at it. But I think right now, uh, China and Russia have been pushed into being so close to one another on this kind of an issue that that China probably isn't a, isn't a fair broker of a peace because they're basically uh, viewed as probably doing Russia's bidding in the process. But, um, you know, uh, it all has to do with uh, taking realistic positions associated with that that area, the, that area of Eastern Europe, uh, that has a lot of history behind it, and um, so Zelensky is is uh, represents the right uh, the rights the right side of politics. I don't, I don't, I don't mean correct. Right, I right. mean he's he's right rather than left in terms of uh, so. The conservative wing in Ukraine is particularly adamant about not giving up any property and uh, any, any geography whatsoever. Uh, that position probably would create a very long conflict because I think Russia is pretty adamant about uh, both Crimea and and the Donetsk region, uh, and some portions of that I think are are undoubtedly going to have to be ceded to Russia. Uh, to reflect some realities that at least Russia believes exist with respect to the history and the, and the, the Russian character of those particular areas. You, you know, Sandy, the American people aren't worried in the least about Ukraine. Um, others aren't worried about Ukraine. America can't broker the deal because it's too close to Ukraine. China can't broker the deal well, because th- it's too close. Well, I think the United States is in a position to to have a great deal of impact on the deal because we are so close to Ukraine. Ukraine is very dependent on us. And I think if we can both overtly promise Ukraine all the support they need to continue their conflict with Russia and behind the scenes then exert influence on Ukraine to take a more to take a an approach to negotiation that could result in a diplomatic settlement. I, I think we're in a position to do that, uh, and I, don't, I, I would guess that that process is ongoing, and I would guess that that process uh, is what's prompting the $60 billion promise so that the promise can be above, on the horizon for Russia to look at, which, which could push them in the direction of negotiating a peace. Certainly, there's no pressure from the American people um, because the American people aren't connected to What's going on in Ukraine? Well, you can see that's the case because right. the Republican side has decided to back off from it, uh, which means that we didn't care enough about it in the first place, which was, as you recall, that yeah. was my problem with uh, our whole policy in Eastern Europe with respect to the NATO invitation and the rest of it, uh, that do we really care enough? Because you understand that if Ukraine is a part of NATO, this invasion would have required that the United States under article five of NATO do everything we would do to defend ourselves, to defend that, that, that geography, which would have put American boots on the ground uh, and would have put us in a direct conflict with Russia. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that Ukraine is a lesson to us. And my concern about the lesson is that some people are calling those who ask questions about Taiwan or Ukraine as accusing them of being isolationists. There are some people who may possibly are isolationists. Trump is being described now as an isolationist. But there are others who are just asking that we have a rational approach to our international affairs, and that we stay internationally active, but active only in a way that reflects uh, the direct interests of the United States. So uh, clearly, Sandy, I don't believe that the American people think that Ukraine 
has any correlation with our nation. And, you know, we don't, what are we getting from Ukraine? What happens in Ukraine, whether Ukraine is overrun by Russia, other than for people to say that we don't want to see, you know, um, innocent people, you know, being being controlled. I, I don't think there's anything that you can say to the American people to make them think that this is something they should be concerned about. Well, I think there are some. Early on, they were. Well, I think there are some who are trying to say that this is the first domino and that this is the beginning of a World War III, that if Ukraine falls, the next is Poland, and, you know, it's the whole domino thing. It's kind of the way we decided to fight in Vietnam. Dom, Vietnam was the, a communist domino, right? And if, if it fell, then who, knows, who knew what was next? The issue, the actual answer was there was nothing next. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that I th- I'd be interested in, in, in what our callers uh, would think about uh, the issue of Ukraine and the general formulation of American foreign policy, because we end up now looking like we're having sort of a schism in Washington between Republicans and Democrats about something like Ukraine. And, and at the same time, those same people are saying, attack attack Iran, but maybe let's not fund Ukraine. You know, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy. All right, listen. Um, well, maybe, maybe, you know, I think that we should ask our callers to think about that uh, while we, while, while we move on through this yeah, well, next segment. Well, news and weather up next on the Earl Ingram show. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> He was, I think, I think Roy was albino. It was an interesting, he had, he had a interesting physical kind of uh, challenges, but a great voice. But if you look at, but, oh, 844-967-2789, uh, you're back. We're back. Uh, and you know, Sandy, uh, Roy Orbison, you, you look at him, you looked at him and he had these Coke bottle glasses, right? And he just was out of character for a guy who was an entertainer, right? Right. Big, kind of yeah. a big guy. Yeah. And uh, but there was something strange about him, man. Well, I, like I said, you know, I think I think the the the, the syndrome is is that called albinism, and and albinism involves a lot, lack of pigment in your eyes. And so you have to wear pink. Oh, that's why he glasses. Wore he wore the glasses, right. I believe, to protect his eyes from the, the circumstance. Sun, right. It also frequently comes with eyes that that uh, move rapidly. Uh, but and, and you know he had he had sort of two comings. He had his original career, and then he sort of went dark for a while, and then he came back. It's uh, it's a big deal. All right, uh, let's go to the phone lines and Susan from Kenosha. Good morning to you, Susan. You hear the job by Roy Orbison? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you had a crush on Roy Orbison. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I do, but I mean, I love his music, but this wasn't the reason why I was calling, but you're so funny. You're so funny. All right, all right go ahead. Um, I, um, I kind of disagree a little bit with Sandy. I'm sorry. I mean, I know that you know far more about this than I do. But I believe that the Ukrainian people deserve their country, their own country. If they have to give up a, a little bit of land for Russia, so be it. But I do feel that they they should be allowed to to control their own country. I think that Putin and the Russians, I think this is just a political 
play and um, they like that port. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, wheat and other things that, that Ukraine offers the world. But I do believe that we should support Ukraine and their people. Um, I kind of think back to, and um, you know, I read a lot. I think back about the um, uh, Jewish people in Germany and what was done to them. And when I see Putin, it brings back those kind of thoughts. And I just don't want to see a country controlled by authoritarian government. That's my last word. Thank you. Thank you very much for the call, Susan. Uh, Sandy? Well, I definitely think that uh, Ukraine is entitled to its sovereignty as well. I I don't think that was, uh, that's never been the purport of what I've had to say. But, uh, you know, the, the, the question was whether Ukraine should be, be a part of NATO and whether Ukraine should lean to the east or lean to the west in terms of its dealings because the world is set up with these sort of uh, areas of, of uh, power, at least in terms of power politics. And, uh, and so my issue has been whether the United States has properly recognized the realities that exist in Eastern Europe uh, that, and, and not recognizing those realities might have been part and parcel of what initiated the conflict. Let me, let me ask you, Sandy, um, because I don't know if people are really giving it a lot of thought, but let's look at what Joe Biden is dealing with and the impact that it may have on people who are going to vote yay or nay. The Middle East issue, the Ukrainian issue, these are, these are major issues that are going on that at different points in time would have been so visible to the American people. You know, different points in, in our history where wars and those kind of things play one of the major roles in deciding and determining who you were going to vote for, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's not the case this time, is it? Well, you know, the question is, you know, we've got a candidate who's running who would say that if I were in office, none of this would happen. I'm not sure that's the case at all. I think if, if someone is in office who's an isolationist, isolationism is going to let those things happen. And the difference is that he's not going to care about them, right? We're not, an isolationist would tell us to turn our back. Don't worry about that. It's not an area of our particular interest. And, uh, you know, to some extent in some areas, of the world that, that might be closer to right. Okay. In terms of looking at the world and deciding that there are areas of the world in which the United States direct interest is not implicated. And so we can't implicate all of our resources, but we've had very measured responses. Our, our response in Ukraine has been quite measured in terms of it being only uh, munitions and money. We've not, we've been very careful about getting directly involved with it. Our response in, in, to the Iranian issue has so far been temperate, okay? And so uh, I think people ought to sit back and reflect on the extent to which whoever is resident of the White House could have had an impact on what it is that's happening. And I'm confident that the Israeli issue, even though Trump would say that it would never have happened on his watch, uh, that, that in fact, he he being in office and being very tight with Netanyahu would have had no impact whatsoever on the, on the question of whether it would have happened. Then the question is what would we have done after it happened? Let me, let me ask you Sandy, because maybe, maybe war is one thing when, if you're giving money or giving munitions is another thing altogether. If, if your, your, um, countrymen are involved in the wars, and because our countrymen aren't involved in those wars, maybe people don't see it the same way. Well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, we, we sustained a war in Afghanistan for 20 years. I just think that we tend to uh, ignore war situations like that unless they are really hitting us at home. And by that, I mean lots of people at home. Currently with our volunteer military, uh, we end up with, uh, and, and the limited number of casualties that are experienced, we, we tend to have a great deal of tolerance for it, I guess. All right, so 30 things Joe Biden did as president 
you might have missed. That's where we're going to be going, Sandy. Uh, but up next, news and weather. I guess I'll go on home, it's late. 